you are pretending to be a girl online and, and having a romantic relationship with a guy, so. I give it to you, you got me there. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 creepiest catfish episodes. Obviously, you know, yeah. I'm Craig, and Fully aware. this is my sister, yeah. Mariah. You don't know my life story. You don't know what I've been through. I was the one doing the catfishing. For this list, we'll be looking at the most awkward and or disturbing episodes of MTV's Catfish. Which catfish creeped you out the most? Let us know in the comments. Number 20, Angel and Remy. How much of the story that you told her was true? I mean, really everything except for the who I am. Sometimes it's not necessarily the story itself that's shocking, but the caught catfish's response. In this episode, an 18-year-old single new mother met Remy on a dating app. It was love on her end as the two spoke every day, and Remy told her he'd gladly step in as a father figure for her child. I basically talk to you like I talk to my best friend. And I'm telling you things that nobody else knows. However, as the show goes, there were a number of red flags. Eventually, Remy was tracked down and met with Neve, Elle, and Angel. He refused to give his real name, was cold and remorseless, said it was a joke to him and that he didn't feel the need to apologize. I feel bad a little bit, but not, not enough for me to sit here and like apologize and tell him I'm wrong for everything I did. The worst part was probably when he said, I mean, I mean who would want to be on TV? Number 19, Craig and Zoe. You don't have to sit there and tell me what I've done because I'm fully aware of what I've done. Craig was speaking to Zoe every day for a year and claimed she was basically his emotional crutch throughout a series of hardships. He'd met her through his sister Mariah, who was also online friends with Zoe, as were a number of her friends. Things went south, however, when Craig tried to meet Zoe four times, and she was a no-show. On the friend side, Zoe used explicit photos and spread rumors to Mariah's friends to turn them against each other. When confronted, she was very cold, had an attitude, and claimed she really didn't care. I don't got no excuse. What was your purpose? Like, um, why? It was just a joke and it just got out of hand. She did it as a retaliation for being tormented in school, albeit not by any of the people she was currently tormenting, who were all strangers to her. I really didn't feel bad. But none of those people did anything to you, right? No, not really. Number 18, Jesus and Alexis. You use pictures of your daughter? Yeah. Jesus is a complete sweetheart, which makes this one all the more heartbreaking. He was talking to Alexis online for a year and got really attached to her emotionally. It really makes you root for him, and it's really upsetting when it's discovered that Alexis is one of multiple profiles all belonging to the same woman. How long have you been the profile? Probably talking to him like a little over a year. The creepy part is that the woman behind Alexis used photos of her own daughter and cousin to create the profiles, even going so far as using her cousin's children's photos. Who's the girl in the Alexis profile? That's my cousin. When confronted, she's extremely defensive and disrespectful, constantly bringing up that she's been through a lot, as though that excuses the ruse. Despite accepting to speak briefly with Jesus, she has a blank expression the entire time. You said it was your daughter. Yeah, but don't yell at me. Number 17, Lucas and Many. So on behalf of all the 400 girls he's talking to, let's go confront this guy. When Jamie wrote into the show, she didn't realize she was unraveling a massive catfish scheme. A former model, dancer, and mother of two, she found Lucas online and felt accepted and emotionally understood. However, Lucas ended up having catfished over 400 women. When confronted, he was completely nonchalant, casual, and unapologetic. I was curious about someone who was as attractive as Lucas, the kind of reception they would get on Tinder versus Zach, myself. He referred to all his victims as, quote, an experiment. Upon meeting Neve, Max, and three of his victims, he was found to be recording their conversation. Neve got a hold of his phone and found his list of women, their descriptions, and the status of their respective relationships. For Megan, it says, on the level of saying, I love you, lives in Vegas, doesn't know she's being catfished. As the group left for the day, he said, miss you all, prompting Neve to give him an earful. What a creep. Miss you all. Wait, what, what'd you say at the end? Miss you all? Yeah. Like, what is that? That just sounded like a joke. 
Number 16, Paul and Katie. We've been together for eight years and have three beautiful children. But recently, I heard him bring up a girl from his past, his first love, Katie. Paul met Katie on Xbox 10 years ago. He was now in a happy long-term relationship with his girlfriend, Sam, yet he still dwelled on the two years he'd spent in love with Katie a decade ago. His present girlfriend contacted the show so that Paul could get some closure on the situation as Katie was his first love. After some sleuthing, Neve and Cammy found out that Paul had been talking to the girl in the photo's mother, Martha. Paul, hi, nice hi. to meet you. Um, nice I meet don't you. know who you are. But this is my mom. This is who Paul was talking to. What? Martha was aware she was talking to a teenager back then and used her daughter's photos in the process, even admitting to sneaking explicit photos off her daughter's phone to send to Paul. We're not sure this is the kind of closure Paul was seeking. Um, you do realize how young I was, right? I do. Number 15, Brendan and McKenna. Yeah, I did not think it'd go this far at all. Brandon met McKenna on a texting app and proceeded to have regular chats via text with her for a few months. He had just been through an awful breakup, which resulted in a severe bout of depression. A now familiar story, his online crush was there for him emotionally. However, red flags, of course, she never actually spoke to him or video chatted. It turned out McKenna was actually Carice, a girl who had been madly in love with Brandon since high school and pursuing him since then as well. I know Carice, I went to school with Carice for four years and you are nothing like who I was talking to one bit. But didn't you fall in love with McKenna, who happens to be me? She would drive by his house and all that fun stalker stuff. Brandon was aware of her pursuit and wasn't interested. After all was revealed, Carice was clearly still infatuated and Brandon now even more disinterested. You seem to be taking this pretty well. I don't like cry ever, so I mean, I'm hurt inside right now, but I'm just not showing it. Number 14, Ari and Lanham. This is Hey. Marcus, aka Lanham, and that's about as far as we got. Ari was an emergency responder in her early 20s who met Lanham on a dating site. She fell hard and found an emotional crutch in chatting with him. He even asked for her ring size. With a little digging, Neve and Max found out he'd been catfishing multiple women and gathering explicit photos. It just started off as a social experiment and then it turned into an addiction. When they finally met with Lanham, he ended up being Marcus, a man in his 40s. He claimed his reason for coming clean was because he wanted to know if it could work out between him and Ari, even presenting her with an engagement ring, which she promptly refused. Max was disgusted, calling Marcus a mid 40 something year old man who's sad, sitting at home in his crusty boxers. Number 13, Kiana and Bow Wow. Well, Oh. I came here, obviously, to introduce you to Kiana. Oh my. This one is something. Kiana, a huge Bow Wow fan, sent a message to the rapper on what she thought was his Facebook page. When she got a response, she was beyond excited and began communicating with him. I just want proof it's you because if it is Bow Wow, it's just like, oh my God, dream come true, fairy tale. She did doubt it was him at one point, but after he sent her over $10,000, she felt reassured. Catfish sleuthing revealed that the person Kiana was really talking to was a woman, D. The creepy part? D admitted to setting up the page to attract women, claiming that she could convert straight women. But those are straight girls that like bow out. Yeah, I mean, for me, I like a challenge. I'm the type, I like a challenge. I like straight girls to see what I can do. When questioned a little further, she admitted to Max that she's gone as far as fooling women with prosthetic genitalia. She had borrowed money from everyone she knew to send and appear rich. Number 12, Spencer and Katie. You can't possibly think it's still Katy Perry. I do. We're not sure if the creepy part in this one was the catfish or the victim. Spencer was convinced he had been in a relationship with Katy Perry online for six years. He even had an expensive ring made in order to propose when he finally did meet her in person. After Neve and Max joined him, they discovered that Katy was in fact Harriet, a girl living in Gloucester, England, with a sexual preference for women. They traveled across the pond with Spencer in tow, only to have him still not believe it wasn't Perry. We found the person you've been talking to. Beyond really any shred of doubt, and you still want to believe 
the thing that makes you happier. He was sure he was being punked. He claimed Perry had sent him clues in her songs and that she had set him up to believe it wasn't her. Number 11, Antoine and Tony. So this is what, payback? Yes, payback. This one is infamous in the catfish canon. Antoine had been chatting online and on the phone with Tony for three years. His cousin Carmen had written into the show to find out if Antoine was being catfished. After a few dead ends in their search, Neve and Max were at an impasse. This is when Carmen confessed to being Tony in a classic case of taking revenge a little too far. Antoine, the reason why you stupid idiot can never find who Tony is because I'm Tony. When Antoine asked her why she did it, she responded with the now classic line, You should have never called me a fat ass Kelly Price. In another classic moment, Carmen was asked which voice was used on the phone calls and answered in a low, surprisingly accurate and creepy masculine tone. The Tony voice. Number 10, Danny and Rosa. There were red flags in this online courtship from the get-go. Florida boy Danny had fallen in love with Rosa, a beautiful if troubled young woman. Unfortunately, Rosa was always coming up with bizarre excuses for why she couldn't meet in person, the worst being that she was arrested for beating up another girl. Neve and Max's arrival only served to make things worse, but even they couldn't have predicted what was about to happen. They took Danny to confront Rosa in person, but were shocked to discover that Rosa was actually a man by the name of Jose. This is just crazy, man. What are you doing, man? And I didn't mean for this to happen like this. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, bro? I am ashamed of myself. In the words of Neve, it turns out Jose was putting on an impressively creepy fake voice the entire time. Can we hear the voice right now? I mean, I don't know what's going on. You know, a lot of things have been changing in my life. Wow. Number nine, Felicia and Jacqueline. Felicia's life was upended when someone stole her name, photos, and created a fake profile. And what Neve and Max found during their investigation was freaky with a capital F. It turns out that the person behind the mask was a girl by the name of Tracy. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> I don't like her. She stole all of Jacqueline Linkwood's friends. Not only was Tracy unaffected by the confrontation, but she openly boasted that she was proud of her actions. This internet Jekyll and Hyde was living as Tracy during the day and posing as Jacqueline by night. Like the whole Jacqueline Lincoln thing was like my only hand I know, Tracy by day. On the internet, I was Jacqueline by night. Is that Hannah Montana? Is that how it works? <laughs> yeah, that's how like I like did everything. When Max asks her if she ever worries about one of her online victims taking their own lives, she flippantly responds by saying it would be their fault, not hers. The worst catfish are the ones who have zero remorse for their actions. Number eight, Lucille and Kid Cole. The internet is littered with creeps like Kid Cole, also known as Jerez Coleman, who are trying to make a quick buck in any way they can. In season three of Catfish, Coleman's scams were brought to light with the help of Neve and Max. The con artist had been posing as a successful rapper in order to fleece unsuspecting victims of their hard-earned money. It's kind of tough. We wanted to find some of your music online, but we, we, we My were... SoundCloud? We went on your SoundCloud page, and we looked into some of the songs that you put up there and you didn't make them. Well, Lucille had had enough and decided to fight back. Unfortunately for her, the confrontation with her aggressor didn't exactly go as planned and ended with Neve tossing Kid Cole's phone into a river. I like that case. Can I see that? <laughs> How'd you do that? You've been playing people. Seeing as how Coleman was later arrested for making serious and violent threats, it would appear he failed to learn his lesson. I'm not trying to deceive people, Scampi. I mean, that's not, that's not. But that's how they're gonna see it. I can understand doing it once, but like, why'd you do it like three times? times? Like the haters shut the hell up. Number seven, John and Kelsey. Prepare to have your rage meter turned up to 11. Hey bro, how's it going? My name's Kelsey. John contacted the Catfish team when he began to suspect that his internet crush Kelsey wasn't who she said she was. When the team finally tracked Kelsey down, they were outraged to discover that Kelsey was actually Adam, a serial catfisher who bragged about his numerous online trickeries. In fact, Adam claimed to have duped 30 to 40 people. I'm the Joker. I mean, this is the kind of loser that gives our show a bad name. I mean, do we really sitting here yeah. giving him any airtime? 
I'm the king of catfishes. The cringiest moment comes when John asks Adam what he thought of an intimate pic he sent. So how'd you like my d pic? Yeah, that was uh, it's interesting. Thank you for sending it to me. I, I really want that on my computer. However, the creepiest moment comes when John asks Adam what his end game is, to which he replies, Just have fun with you, man. That was it. You know, it was a game. It's over now. So this is all just fun and games? Yeah, really it is, yeah. Yikes. Number six, Mike and Caroline. When someone you meet online refuses to meet up in person and instead chooses to leave super creepy notes on your car, you know you have a problem. Caroline and I live in the same city, however, I have still yet to meet her. Wait, time out. If you're talking to someone who lives in your city and they don't want to meet up with you, they're a catfish and you should run. Such was the case for Mike, who thought he'd met the love of his life in Caroline, only to discover that she was an entirely different person. The creepiness didn't stop with drive-by notes either. Mike claims that Caroline would take pictures of the outside of his work and send them to him, and that she told him she had colon cancer. In the end, Caroline turned out to be a woman by the name of Heather, who was not only cancer-free, but had actually catfished Mike before. I don't want to not have Michael in my life, no matter how I can have you other than being sick and being a teacher and what I look like in my name is real. If that were us, we'd be on the next bus out of town. Well, how would you continue to put yourself through this? It was being hopeful. It was believing you. Number five, Rod and Ebony. So Rod has kind of been lying to Ebony. Right. But he's afraid that Ebony has been lying, lying to, him. to him for four I mean, years. These two potential lovebirds met on an online dating site. Rod was just a guy looking for love, and Ebony presented herself as a transgender woman simply seeking friendship. The two wound up chatting and eventually professed their love for one another. However, trouble was brewing beneath the surface of this seemingly perfect online connection. I'm disappointed, I'm hurt, and I really feel like I don't know you. Who the f lies about a name for four years? Who lies about a picture? Who are you? Like, who are you? It turns out that Ebony was not in fact transgender at all, but was instead a lesbian woman. Rod was shocked and ultimately confessed, saying he, quote, was just using Ebony because she was sending me money and I don't really have feelings for her. Damn, that's harsh. The two have since mended their relationship, but at this point, they're just friends. I will see if I can forgive you. I don't know. I don't know. I forgive you. Number four, Blair and Marky. This relationship was steeped in drama from the get-go. Blair met Marky on Instagram and the two quickly hit it off. However, when Blair asked to meet up, Marky concocted an elaborate tale involving a kidnapping and a stint in the hospital. A week before they were going to meet in New York after Blair bought a plane ticket for Marky, Marky gets kidnapped. And then a week later, she calls from a mental institution. Things only got stranger when Neve and Max were finally able to get the two women together for a sit down. The mystery girl was surprisingly upbeat about the meeting, but still couldn't stop herself from spinning a web of lies when she was asked to explain herself. I was scared, you're right, but that doesn't mean I wasn't gonna bail out on you. You kinda did though, if you think about it. We don't know what the creepiest part about this episode was, Marky's lies or her overall aloofness to the entire situation. I don't really want you to leave. I don't want you to leave it all. Then be honest, be honest with me. Number three, Kayla and Courtney. Although Courtney has been giving me messages from my dad, I haven't seen him since I was a kid. The reason being is that my dad passed away almost 14 years ago. If a stranger contacts you claiming to be a medium for your dead father's spirit, maybe call the cops and not the producers of a reality show. Kayla, whose dad killed her mother before taking his own life, went with the latter, with predictably creepy results. Unlike most episodes of Catfish, Courtney never pretends to be someone else. She simply claims to be acting on behalf of Kayla's deceased father. It's all incredibly spooky, with the eeriest moment occurring when the two finally meet in person. With Neve and Max looking on, the two women share an awkward embrace, with Courtney remarking that Kayla has her father's eyes. You have your dad's eyes. <laughs> Oh, you saw your dad's eye. While the catfish boys appear skeptical, Kayla seems willing to accept Courtney's story, which just makes it creepier. It's really hard for me to like cope with all of this at once. 
I just don't really understand all of this pretty like it's crazy. Number two, Tracy and Sammy. We're dealing with someone who is, you know, obsessed and and therefore maybe uh, perhaps dangerous. This catfish episode still sends shivers down our spines. Tracy, an actress living in Los Angeles, was contacted by Sammy, one of her fans. She told Tracy all about her friend Reese, who was dying from cancer. And I was like, something's not right. I don't know what it is. And then, Dead Reese just favorited her own RIP tweet. She later claimed that Reese had passed away and even provided Tracy with footage of her funeral. Sammy turns out to be 100% real, which does little to calm our nerves. During their tense confrontation, Tracy asks Sammy about that creepy funeral footage, only to discover that it was from Sammy's cousin's funeral. Whose funeral was that? My cousin's. So your cousin died? Yeah. You went to your cousin's funeral and filmed it. What? Uh, yeah, doesn't get much weirder than that. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Artists and Jess Everything about this catfish encounter was creepy as hell. Artists met Jess online and the two immediately hit it off, despite both being in relationships at the time. Artist was willing to leave the mother of his three children to be with Jess, but things, uh, didn't exactly work out the way he'd hoped. Neve and Max arranged for the two to meet, but Artist was flabbergasted when a scruffy dude named Justin showed up instead. You're gay. Obviously, I'm not gay. Well, it's not so obvious. I mean, you, you, you are pretending to be a girl online and, and having a romantic relationship with a guy, so. I give it to you. You got me there. Right. So, may, maybe. The encounter was something out of a David Lynch film, with Justin emerging from his car, slow clapping and dripping in attitude. This <laughs> this. He immediately launches into an aggressive tirade that culminates in the now infamous You can still be my chocolate kiss too, you don't forget about that, baby. Comment. Sweet dreams. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.